Okay, we're going to talk about ultrasound of the gallbladder, some scanning techniques, some anatomy, and of course, uh, really focus on the pathology. This is a typical patient that comes in the emergency department, 49-year-old female, epigastric pain. You know, it's kind of vague. We're worried a little bit about chest pain here, but she can't. she's kind of a poor historian. It's hard to nail down really where the pain's coming from. She's a smoker. She's kind of obese, and she's sort of tender in that epigastric area. Um, the uh, rectal exam is negative for cold blood, or EKG doesn't show anything abnormal. Laboratory tests not helping us out here. And so now we have this woman who's got sort of vague epigastric pain that we know that women have very atypical presentations of cardiac ischemia, and we're wondering if this is some, potentially some kind of um, problem with her heart, maybe a, maybe a heart attack that's not showing up on the EKG, which is actually quite common. So we, um, you know, we go to the bedside, and my resident's really worried about the cardiac stuff, and um, you know, we do an ultrasound together, and um, and you know, we, we look at the uh, the ultrasound screen, and uh, we see this. We see um, essentially what what amounts to this is her, her gallbladder here. There's a large gallstone down here in the neck. We see some biliary sludge as well. Here's that gallstone down the neck. We see some biliary sludge, and there's a stone here, some shadowing over here in the body of the gallbladder as well, uh, right around here. And <clears throat> my resident looks at me and says. You know, this this could still be you know something with the heart, and uh, I say yeah it could be. But then I take the, the the probe, which you can see it's footprint here. It's that large C60 footprint. I take that probe and then I I lean in on it, and the patient actually looks up at me. And as I lean in on that probe, she says, "Yep, right there. That's the exact pain that brought me into your ER." And uh, and I look over the resident. I'm like, um, "Yeah, I don't think it's the heart." I think it's the gallbladder. And so I think ultrasound at the bedside, this is one of a very common example that helps me be a more accurate clinician. <clears throat> so when you scan a patient's um, gallbladder, uh, there's uh, the, 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 the classic way is to, you know, do what's known as a subcostal sweep. You start with the, um, the probe indicator aimed towards the patient's head. And then you slide down along the subcostal margin. As the patient takes a deep breath, that gets the gallbladder out from under the rib cage. And I know you guys already know this. This is just some review here before I get into the pathology. The gallbladder's got a fundus, a body, and a neck. And um, it can be up to 10 centimeters in length and up to, you know, 3 centimeters in width before it's a fully obstructed gallbladder. When a gallbladder is fully obstructed, it's called hydrops of the gallbladder. And that's when it gets, when it, goes beyond these measurements okay now one of the things that can help when you're having a tough time is uh, is reverting back to, to your knowledge of anatomy and you know that the second portion of the duodenum rolls behind uh, the gallbladder there so if you if you put the patient on their left side then that duodenal loop that has the air in it rolls away from the gallbladder and now you can get a much better view of that gallbladder so here we are kind of struggling to see the gallbladder there's this um, sort of you know, loop a bowel in the way we can make out a little bit of that gallbladder over here. And then what we do is we have the patient roll uh, over to the side and we can see that gallbladder much better. So there's something called the X minus 7 approach, and that's the alternate way to find the gallbladder. So you've got the subcostal sweep, and then you've got X minus 7. Now, X minus 7 is when you take the, the transducer and you put it over the xiphoid process, and then you want to march 7 centimeters laterally, and you're going to go in between the ribs. And, uh, and when you go in between the ribs, that's when um, you're doing an intracostal or X minus seven approach. The gallbladder is more rounded over there. It's a little bit more higher up in the abdomen, and this is typical in patients who have larger uh, body habitus. And so what we're doing is basically starting where the xiphoid process is, and we're taking the transducer. We're going to march it over here, put the probe right perpendicular to the skin. And uh, more often than not, that's where we see the gallbladder. Again, higher up and more rounded uh, in these types of patients. Notice that we're using a smaller footprint transducer. So to do X minus 7, the large footprint C60 doesn't work out so well. you got to switch it up to that P21 transducer. And so that's what's nice about the P21. It goes X minus 7 and also can do a subcostal sweep as well, though not as pretty as the C60. Uh, you can definitely get away with the P21, the subcostal sweep. But the X minus 7 is ideal for the P21 because it's meant to go between the ribs. Now, the gallbladder can be very elusive. We can find the gallbladder in all these different locations, even in older patients. 
Uh, I found it like way down here, even over here sometimes. It just everything kind of sags as you get older, and you find the gobbler all the way down here sometimes. But but that's okay. You just got to keep looking for it, and uh, you will find it. It does um, really challenge your art of being a sonologist and finding it. So um, you may need to move the probe in many different planes to get there. Now, the good news about gallstones uh, is that it's made for ultrasound. They're echogenic, they shadow, and they're mobile, so they collect in uh, dependent locations. And that's what makes ultrasound so sensitive and specific for gallstones is the fact that uh, they, they, they have these sonographic characteristics. And when I say they're mobile, I'm not kidding. Look at this next video here. We've got a patient who's got a mobile gallstone. It starts down here towards the neck, and then what we do is we sit the patient up, and then the gallstone moves up towards their fundus. So they're gravitationally dependent. And uh, sometimes if you're lucky, you can catch that right on the ultrasound video itself. Now, if you have a fold down in the neck of the gallbladder, it's called a fold down in the neck of the gallbladder. But if you have a fold up here at the, at the fundus of the gallbladder, that's called something special. It's called a pharyngean cap. And you got to be careful with these pharyngean caps because sometimes a gallstone can, can be hiding out up here in that pharyngean cap. And so the neck of the gallbladder is down towards here. The fundus is up here. There's a little fold up there. And then boom. There's a little shadow coming out, and, um, and that's your pharyngean cap there, a fundal stone, as we're seeing. You can also have a stone hiding down here in the neck. And so here we've got this fold. The fundus is up here. You come along. The neck of the gallbladder is down here. And this, this is what we call the stone and neck sign, or S-I-N, sin sign, is where you see the gallstone hanging out down there in the neck. So you just got to make sure you're fanning all the way through these gallbladders. Okay, so we found a fundal stone, a stone in the neck. And now I'm going to show you a very confusing picture. Well, not confusing, but it can be very elusive. And it's called a west sign. And a west sign means um, we're, what we actually see here, it's a contracted gallbladder with stones in it. So what we see here is the anterior wall of the gallbladder, or W, the E, or echogenic stone, and then the S is the shadow. Okay, so wall, echo, shadow, or west sign. And this is the common situation. A patient's got um, right upper quadrant epigastric pain. Um, my resident goes in uh, to scan the patient, and then they come walk down the room and they go, uh, I couldn't find the gallbladder, but what I did find was a big shadow coming out of the gallbladder. And then that tips me off. There's probably a west sign. And so I go back in the room and I scan the patient, and indeed I can tell that this is the anterior wall. And as we fan through it, we'll see the E, the echogenic stone, and the S, the shadow coming down. So if all I see is a shadow coming out of the liver, then I start to think maybe this patient actually has a contracted gallbladder around gallstones. But then again, they may have had their gallbladder removed. And they forgot to tell you or they didn't remember. It's interesting the kinds of things patients forget. Um, I think one of the most intimate relationships a doctor and a patient can have together is when the doctor cuts them open and, and like takes out their organs. Uh, and it's amazing to me. Um, time and time again, a patient will not remember that they've had a surgery. And to have your gallbladder taken out is, is uh, I mean, it's no small, you know, surgery. So um, you got to sometimes turn the lights back on and check for scars. Make sure the patient didn't actually already have their gallbladder taken out. So what do you think about these images here? Doesn't this look like a contracted gallbladder with stones in it? Well, it's not. And the reason why you know it's not is because it's got this hypoechoic uh, outer wall. And anywhere in the body where there's a hypoechoic outer wall, well, that's bowel that looks like that. It looks like that up at the esophagus, as you'll see in your hands-on session, and it looks like that uh, all the way down through the rectum. And this is the duodenum. It lies right up against the edge of the liver here. Um, and if it's uh, peristalsing along, you'll see air. Again, this is just the duodenum here, not the gallbladder. <coughs> so here we see another really cool example of how the second portion of the duodenum lies posterior to the gallbladder. You see, this is all the gallbladder here, all right? And then right here, there's like a little little lump here, and that's this duodenum that's kind of pooching into the posterior wall of the gallbladder. And if you look at that duodenum and play the video some more, you'll see it actually peristalse. And as that duodenum peristalses, there's air in there. Air looks a lot like a hypercoic structure. There can be shadowing from the air, and you can see how you could easily mistake uh, an intraluminal gallstone for 
uh, intra intra luminal air in the in the duodenum. So not stone in the gallbladder, but air in the duodenum. So I just want you to be um, intimately aware of that anatomy uh, relationship. So here's an example. What do you think is going on here? Well, the folks who did the ultrasound saw this image and became a little excited that this could actually be a Westside. And, um, you know, they call me in the room and I look at this and immediately I know this is not a West sign, but instead this is the duodenum. And because it's peristalsing and it's like hyperchoic and it's kind of peristalsing along and that, that, that's kind of how I know and it. And, it. and it has these comet tail artifacts extend to the bottom of the screen and the air, air is what causes those comet tails. So air is funny. Sometimes air causes a bright white artifact and sometimes air causes a very dark shadow. You can see both of those being elicited here and that's um, why air is a conundrum uh, to us as sonologists is that it can cause both types of artifacts. Depends the angle which the sound hits it. So what do you think about this next one here? You think it's a west sign or do you think this is the duodenum? Well, it's got a hypercoic wall to it and I don't see any peristalsis. And I see these little echogenic areas all coming together to make one fat shadow. So this is definitely a west sign. And so we can see the wall. Let me freeze this here. The wall. Here's the echo. And then the shadow is coming down here. So this is a wall echo shadow west sign. But this next one here. This is a concept called sludge. Now, when, um, when you get gallstones, it's basically... Um, like the chylomicrons all coming together, they kind of all line up, and initially they're just a bunch of sludge, but then eventually those sludge particles like glom together to crash out a solution and make a stone, make a very much more dense echogenic stone. So many times you see the whole continuum, you'll see sludge and maybe what looks appears to be maybe a little stone formation going on in one part of it. Not too clear that I see that here, but definitely I can see the meniscus that is uh, the sludge. And notice how isochoic the sludge is with the liver. I want you to look at that before I move to the next slide. See how this sludge here can like look a lot like um, the liver over here? So think about that. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. Remembering the sludge can be isochoic. And this was one that was very confusing initially to my residents, but here's the gallbladder here. We can see the wall here. This is all the liver over here, this hepatic vein kind of hanging out over here. Um, you know, we're kind of looking at that. It's pretty. But then we see the we see the structure here. We think, oh, is that like a mass in the liver? What is that? Well, it's right where the gallbladder should be. And it turns out <clears throat> the patient has all this sludge. And there's actually a stone right down here, down towards the neck. I don't know if you can make that out or not. But so, but look how isoechoic sludge is with the liver. It's kind of like the way um, when there's a blood clot, when blood congeals, comes out of solution into a more gelatinous matrix, it looks very isoechoic with the liver or the spleen as well. And so similar sort of echo texture there in those organs. It's pretty. Okay, so what's happening here? Same patient, same gallbladder, same gallstone. What's the difference? It's like when you're reading um, Us Magazine and you're like trying to figure out the difference between two pictures and they did some Photoshop thing to it. <laughs> well, we didn't do anything Photoshoppy here to this. What we did was um, we basically um, did a... a um, we adjusted the machine in some way. We, you know, thinking about the physical principles of ultrasound, why is it that this stone doesn't shadow, but this stone does shadow? And I know right away your, your mind is going to the word gain, and that's not the right answer. It's not the gain. Everybody always says gain, so that's how I knew that you were thinking that. No, it's not gain. It's a different thing. So you see, when the sound is coming out here, it reaches this gallstone, but it's able to penetrate right past it, okay? Yeah, that word penetration, that's what should clue you into um, the frequency adjustment. Because over here, the sound comes along, but it can't penetrate past this gallstone. And so then there's a shadow that comes down. So therefore, what we did was we went to the resolution mode or turned up the frequency. Down here, we might be on the penetration mode or lower frequency. So to put this into numbers, this might be down around 1 megahertz, and this could be up around 5 megahertz. Okay, so see how frequency can cause more attenuation of the sound, thereby helping us confirm that, yes, indeed, that is a gallstone because it shadows. Over here, we're wondering, hmm, maybe it's a polyp. Polyps don't shadow, um, but when we turn up the frequency, we get it to shadow. That makes us feel better that this is a gallstone.
You're going to measure the wall of the gobbler along its anterior surface. How do I know that that's the anterior surface of the gallbladder? Well, simply because it's closest to the skin line. And the skin line's up here. We plop the probe down on the anterior part of the body. And so this must be anterior, and we're shining the sound posteriorly. So this makes this the posterior wall. In the area up here is the anterior wall. And it should be a nice linear echo like this. Less than three millimeters is normal. Three to five millimeters is thickened. Greater than five millimeters is definitely pathologic. So this is what a pathologic gallbladder wall looks like. See how thickened that is there? Again, we're measuring it along the anterior wall. We see some gallstones down here, some shadowing. This is what gallbladder wall thickening looks like. This gallbladder is the sickest gallbladder I've ever seen. Um, it's got an incredibly thickened wall with pockets of just straight up edema in it. And this is actually the lumen right here. It's crazy. So that's the lumen. This is the anterior wall. You know, these are one centimeter hash marks. You're looking at like it. Now we're going short axis. You're looking at like, you know, maybe a two to three centimeter thickened gallbladder wall here. So that's pretty sick. Um, but here's another conundrum, not to scare you away from the gallbladder, but I want you to embrace the pitfalls and the conundrums. This is a patient who's got a contracted gallbladder. We see these quite often. It's basically after somebody eats, the gallbladder contracts down, and you can see, you can kind of make out the redundancies in the walls here, the layers of the wall here. So this is like the outer layer gets very reflective. The middle layer is anechoic, and the inner layer is also reflective. And when they contract down like that, this is what you see. And on a video, this is what else you see. So this is a contracted gallbladder here. It's just the gallbladder that's sort of responded appropriately to cholecystokinin. It's always funny because we get these people come in and they're, they're complaining of abdominal pain, but they're eating um, those fire Cheetos out in my waiting room, which has a lot of fat in it, and it stimulates the gallbladder. And then we look at their gallbladder and we're like, wait a minute, why is your gallbladder so contracted? And then, you know, they admit to the, to the fatty meal as they're complaining of abdominal pain. So here's a patient here who's got ascites. And so when the liver stops working, stops making the proteins, you get extravasation of fluid from the intravascular space into the third space of the peritoneal cavity. And then you can see that as ascites. We see these sharp angles and wedges. Very easy to see on ultrasound. Um, it's one of the greatest, um, or the, one of the best uses of ultrasound is to diagnose a patient with ascites. And what we see here is the, the wall um, that absorbs that fluid, okay? so. With, with ascites, the gallbladder wall is funny. It will, it will like suck up the ascites and get like a sponge and then get, get thickened. And so it's hard to, again, judge clinically, does this patient have a thickened wall or is this just ascites? And so you have to kind of gauge it by how, um, how much distress the patient's in. And when you, when you take the transducer and you lean in on the gallbladder, and the patient says, ouch, right there, that's it. That's the pain that brought me into your ER. That's something called the sonographic Murphy sign. And so that's one way I would try to distinguish whether this is just physiologic process of fluid absorbing into the wall of the gallbladder, or does this patient actually have acute cholecystitis? I'm going to get into that here in a minute, a little bit more detail for you. So this is another example of actual, this is an example of true pericholecystic fluid. You see, when the gallbladder gets infected, what happens is it goes from being something called cholelithiasis to being infected or itis, cholecystitis. So cholecystitis is when you've got a number of findings. You'll have a thickened gallbladder wall, more than three millimeters. Um, you'll have many times the evidence of gallstones. In this case, it appears to be a bunch of little punctate hypercoic areas here that are gallstones. And interestingly, what we see here, and somewhat rare, is this wedge of free fluid right there. Do you see that? I'm going to freeze it when it comes up. You see this sharp angle here? Okay, so we shouldn't see any sharp angles in nature. Uh, but when fluid is wedging between the gallbladder and a loop of bowel, and maybe the liver edge over here, when you see those all areas kind of wedged together, the fluid outlines these areas. And you see these sharp angles and wedges coming this way. That's abnormal. That's pericholecystic fluid. And this is a patient that clinically would probably look very sick in front of me. They may even be jaundiced. They may have a fever, elevated white blood cell count. 
you know, um, and then that positive sonographic Murphy sign. So I take that probe, lean it on the skull bladder, and then they would uh, let me know right away that that was not comfortable. Now here's another example coming up um, of pericholecystic fluid. We can see this sharp angle wedging out up here. We also see a thickened gallbladder wall. I'm, I mean, just looking at it, I can tell it's no longer just a linear line, but it's got some thickness to it. Um, and there's some there's a stone back here, some shadowing. And so this is a good case here of acute cholecystitis. So putting it all together, acute cholecystitis once again means gallstones. Um, oftentimes you'll have a thickened wall, and then occasionally rarely you'll see pericholecystic fluid. Now you don't need all these things to make the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. Heck, you can just have gallstones and a thick wall and uh, and call it. Or you could have a sonographic Murphy sign um, and that's an even more specific sign for, uh, for acute cholecystitis. So those are the types of things we look for, but in this case we've got all the findings. We have the stones, we've got the pericholecystic fluid, we've got the thickened wall, there's that fluid right there, we've got the thickened wall, and um, yeah, this is a classic case of Q. cholecystitis. Now there's something else, uh, boy this is gonna sound really confusing, but there's something else where some patients just have a lot of fat in their livers, and especially around the gallbladder in that fossa, you can see um, this very dark, these dark areas, and it looks just like pericholecystic fluid, except it's not sharp angles, and clinically the patient has no signs of um, cholecystitis. They're like looking around the room smiling, totally happy. You lean on their gallbladder, they don't even know that you're doing it. The gallbladder wall is linear, it's not thickened, and we see these dark areas around the gallbladder. Now before you rush these patients off to surgery, you want to know about this thing called focal fatty sparing. It just basically means that these hypochoic regions that surround the gallbladder in some patients, it's actually somewhat common, I see it probably uh, once a month on a patient, and everybody gets excited about it. The patient um, turns out just to have focal fatty sparing. And then there's polyps. I briefly mentioned it earlier that you could see this pulp adhered to the wall of the gallbladder, but it doesn't shadow. There's no shadow coming down from it. And so that's how I know that uh, it's not a stone. And there may be some duodenum back here that is shadowing, but this is how these gallbladder polyps look. They look sort of pedunculated. And they don't move with, uh, with gravitational forces. This is a very sad thing. This is cholangiocarcinoma. And I say sad because it has a horrendous prognosis. And this happens a lot where a patient comes in with epigastric or quadrant pain. I go in the room, I think they're probably going to have gallstones. And then, you know, we have a very different conversation after the ultrasound. It's, uh, but that's what it looks like. It looks very sort of um, irregular shaped. And we can see that there's just these kind of irregular areas to it. I'm going to play this clip one more time here of the cholangiocarcinoma. You can see the, the irregular borders to it. Okay, so And it's not casting a shadow. And it's different than a polyp because a polyp will just be like a little pedunculated thing. But this has all these irregular borders to it. Like a mass. All right. Now, once you master the gallbladder, then you can then move on to the, to the biliary system. And by that, I mean the, the, what you're really looking for is the common bile duct. And because if the common bile duct is dilated, it, it could mean that there's a, there's a bunch of things going on, um, like an obstruction that's um, distal to the common bile duct. It may be a, a tumor in the head of the pancreas, uh, because the common bile duct has to get into the duodenum, and many times it goes either through the pancreas to do that, um, or it just goes directly into the duodenum. There may be a stone blocking the, the distal common bile duct, causing it to be dilated. And um, that's, that's a condition called cholidocolithiasis, when you have a stone in the distal common bile duct. Um, and to find it, you need to find the hepatic artery, um, but really you need to find the, the portal vein. The portal vein and the common bile duct are like BFFs. They run together in a very reliable pattern. You know, the hepatic artery is kind of a fair-weather friend. It comes, and it goes, and it comes, and it goes, and it's kind of ir irregular and a lot smaller caliber, but the CBD, or common bile duct, is very reliably anterior to the portal vein. And so it looks a little something like this when you, when you have it. Um, we can see here that we're going through. We can see the, the portal vein is uh, going to be right up here.
and uh, we're looking anterior to that portal vein. We're trying to stretch out right here. So there's the portal vein there, and just anterior to it is the common bile duct. It's kind of fun to zoom in on it. Yeah, you're right. There's some sludge in this gallbladder over here. I saw that too, but here's the portal vein. There's the common bile duct, and uh, you want to measure it. And it should be uh, less than 6 millimeters. This one is 3 millimeters. And so I can just kind of eyeball that portal vein as long as that CBD is smaller than the portal vein. I know it's probably going to be a normal size CBD, but once that CBD starts to approximate the size of the portal vein, that's when I'm going to stop and drop some calipers on it and make sure that it's um, you know, not getting too big. So another example here of how to find the, um, find the structure. This is the IVC down here, and this is the portal vein seen here. Hepatic artery is right here. Again, the fair weather friend that comes and goes, but the common bile duct is reliably anterior to the portal vein. And sometimes, you know, Doppler can be helpful using some color flow Doppler here to outline some of the vascular structures. And obviously, the common bile duct is not going to light up with flow because it's not a blood vessel. And this one's 8.8 .8 millimeters. Again, once it starts to approximate the size of the portal vein, you got to worry about it. So um, here we're looking at the um, the the portal vein and the hepatic artery and the common bile duct. We're seeing this in a short axis view, meaning we rotated the transducer um, towards the patient's head. And as we do that, we're going to get the, all this vasculature in the short axis because the portal vein runs sort of medial to lateral across the body. So if I aim the indicator towards the patient's head, I'll see these vessels in a short axis. And as I do so, it's called the Mickey Mouse sign. And Mickey's right ear is the common bile duct. This is his head. This is his left ear, like he's staring back at us, his right ear. So Mickey's right ear is the common bile duct. This one has a stone in it or cholecholelithiasis. But I'm not as big of a fan as the Mickey Mouse sign as I am the long axis view because sometimes you can get twisted around. You don't always see the hepatic artery, as I mentioned. It comes and goes. And uh, just to me, this anatomy can be variable and confusing. But when you line things up in the long axis, I think it's much easier to see. Here we are back in that long axis again. Portal vein, common bile duct, hepatic arteries right here. IVC is down here. Aorta looks to be over here. That left renal vein is probably coming across and dumping into IVC. We're seeing portal vein, common bile duct up here. Once again, we see here portal vein, big common bile duct, very dilated. Portal veins here, IVC is down here, portal vein. CBD is here. Hepatic vein is running through the liver up here. This is all common bile duct right here. Once in a while, you might see a little flash artifact in that common bile duct just from the way the patient's breathing and the Doppler's trying to keep up with that. But that's the, um, you see this large portal vein here. It's more than a centimeter if you look at these centimeter hash marks over here. Now, this is really cool. This is a stone seen here in the distal common bile duct. So this is the common bile duct here. In fact, there's Intrahepatic ductal dilatation, we can see all these dilated intrahepatic biliary ducts as they come across and drain into the common bile duct. And then we see this large stone with the shadow coming down here in that common bile duct. So this is cholecholelithiasis, a stone that's in the distal common bile duct with very dilated CBD. This is like, you know, almost two centimeters. So in summary, I think it's helpful to have the patient take a very large breath. That helps get the gallbladder out from under the rib cage. I always roll them left lateral decubitus. If you're still struggling, you can go X minus 7, use a small footprint transducer. Duodenal air can look like gallstones. Wall echo shadow can look like the duodenum. And you want to look anterior to that portal vein to find the common bile duct. Using bedside ultrasound, the urinary bladder is an easy to identify organ seen as an anechoic rectangular shaped structure just below the skin line, uh, down low in the midline of the pelvis. The bladder should have a smooth wall throughout its perimeter, so the idea is to look for any irregularities in the wall, such as a focal mass or any areas of thickening, either in a focal location or diffusely, and any outpouching like a diverticulum. There are two types of commonly encountered bladder cancers, 
The first type is transitional cell carcinoma, and these are found in people who smoke cigarettes, textile workers, painters, hairdressers, metal workers. The other type is squamous cell carcinoma, and these are more aggressive. Patients with chronic bladder infections or who have chronic irritation from catheters and stones are at risk for squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. So whether a solid mass is seen or simply a focal wall thickening of the bladder, one must assume that the sonographic appearance of any focal wall abnormality must be cancer and worked up as such until proven otherwise. These are ultrasound images from a 68-year-old female with a history of urgency who had a negative urinalysis. Along the posterior wall of her bladder, there are multiple masses seen. These masses turned out to be bladder tumors. Of technical note, the depth is at 18 centimeters. This is too deep. You should decrease this to maybe 12 so that the bladder takes up the majority of the screen. Here's another example. These images are from a 72-year-old gentleman who had urinary retention and underwent this post-void residual ultrasound. Now what that means is somebody is instructed to void their contents of the bladder or urinate and then you come back and you look in their bladder and upon close inspection or not so close inspection it's pretty easy to see this giant tumor here mass in the posterior wall of his bladder and all of this urine residual volume here the post void residual is what is left over after this person tries to urinate but because of this large obstructing mass he's unable to void the contents of his bladder Here's another example of a bladder mass seen along the posterior wall of the bladder as we fan through it. Since this is a sagittal view of the bladder, eventually we turn this probe into a sagittal view. I think it starts off sort of transverse and then we rotate it to a sagittal view. We can measure the length, and I'll get into this a little bit more in a minute, but this is the length of the gallbladder, of the bladder, and this mass down here we're measuring is the length of this particular mass because we've got the indicator pointed towards the patient's head in a sagittal view. And now, this is a 28-year-old male who's brought in by paramedics who's found down with altered mental status. Initially, he was thought to have a mass in his pelvis on the physical exam, but ultrasound showed that this mass was a hematoma that was superior to the bladder. Well, this is because the transducer, again, is in the sagittal plane, and the hematoma is seen on the left side of the screen. Here we are transverse, actually, and then we fanned past the bladder. We can see the hematoma. But then when we go into a sagittal view, we can see that this is a, here in the sagittal view, initially we can see that this is superior to the bladder. Here's the bladder here. This is towards the head. This is superior. This is inferior. And this is all this isocoque hematoma. Now we go back into that transverse plane. And we can see the, hematoma seen here, and then we fan more inferiorly, and we can see the bladder seen underneath it, the transverse plane. Sorry, I think that's a little bit confusing. So when it comes to cystitis or bladder infection, the most common way of finding it on ultrasound is to look for a thickened bladder wall. Now, normally, bladder walls are not thickened, but they're just a normal thin wall there, even with early cystitis. But with repeated or severe infections, the bladder wall actually itself can become quite thickened, and this is often complicated by focal areas of calcification within the bladder wall. Other ultrasound findings seen with cystitis include intraluminal echogenic debris or a stone within the bladder, prostatic enlargement, a bladder diverticulum, and urinary retention with elevated post-void residual volumes. And so in patients who can't really talk to us, like um, this two-year-old female, um, she has frequent urinary tract infections. She presents the emergency department with fever and dark urine on this bladder ultrasound. One can see diffuse bladder wall thickening consistent with pediatric cystitis. Another population I might use this in would be an elderly patient who's unable to convey their symptoms to me. Because usually cystitis is actually a pretty, you know, clinical diagnosis, but occasionally um, our patients can't give us very good histories, and so we need to turn to ultrasound or some type of imaging or tests or whatever. And so in this case, we can see very thickened wall bladder here, um, greater than a centimeter symmetrically, in this case of chronic cystitis. Another notable finding is the presence of echogenic material within the bladder lumen. Bladders should be anechoic and completely devoid of internal echoes. The presence of debris swirling around in the bladder may represent evidence of 
bladder infection. If calculi are too large to exit through the urethra, they may continue to enlarge and reside in the bladder, ultimately becoming quite symptomatic. Now, these are images here from an 89-year-old female who came in from a nursing home with foul-smelling urine and fever. Ultrasonography revealed this echogenic structure within the bladder lumen that also demonstrated posterior shadowing. These images here are from a 69-year-old, otherwise healthy female who had urinary urgency for six months. One can see that within the lumen of the bladder, there's an echogenic calculus uh, which represents this bladder stone. There's acoustical shadowing seen posterior to that um, stone as well. Now, these images here from a 77-year-old female came in from a nursing home who basically had like abdominal bloating. We weren't really sure what was going on. We had this plain film. Now, on this plain film inside this pelvis, we see this you know, sort of round structure here, and you can imagine all the interesting findings that uh, were sort of subjected to in the emergency department over the years. Um, that come in on a plain film in this particular region. Uh, so we weren't really sure what was going on. Our mind starts to wander, but we get the ultrasound, and here we see this is actually just a simple bladder stone. It's within the uh, bladder. It just shows a, a shadow uh, posteriorly. Here's a young person, 27-year-old female, who's status post rollover motor vehicle crash. I'm uh, sorry, 27-year-old 20, uh, male. Now, he had no seatbelt on and was traveling at a pretty high rate of speed. Dark blood was seen coming out of his foley and blood clots intermittently obstructing his catheter. Ultrasound here of his bladder demonstrates clotted blood surrounding the Foley balloon. That's what all of this material is here. We can see some of the urine still up on this part of the bladder. The bladder is kind of this whole structure here. And here's that Foley balloon here. And basically, we just kept irrigating this bladder copiously until the catheter was optimally draining. Here's a 50-year-old guy who came in with a, he had a, left, a known left renal mass in hematuria. Um, his urinalysis was grossly appeared dark red, and this was his bladder ultrasound. Notice the presence of isoechoic you know, blood clots seen settling out in his posterior bladder. It's all this isoechoic material here um, that is his, um, his clot. This is actually the amount of urine that was left in his bladder after he tried to void, this is his post-void residual. And now in the sagittal view, we can see how this clot is kind of layering out inferiorly and posteriorly in his bladder, obstructing the urethra. Now, a bladder diverticulum results from a focal weakening in the bladder wall with herniation of the bladder mucosa through the muscularis layer. This can be congenital or acquired through high pressure voiding through distal obstruction. Of note, these Diverticuli do not have muscle fibers, and therefore they have no detrusor ability. So here's a 56-year-old guy with chronic urinary tract infections. He comes with abdominal pain, fever, and vomiting. This bladder ultrasound was done. It showed initially what appeared to be a large, abnormally shaped bladder, but upon further scanning, this initial object turned out to be a large bladder diverticulum that was confluent uh, with the bladder. You're going to see that some of this debris here is just kind of layering out, and then we can see this bladder diverticulum that is confluent. This is the bladder over here. It's kind of got thickened walls. We overgain it a little bit, makes it easier to see, and it's relatively empty, but then we can see how this thickened wall here is then suddenly confluent with this diverticulum seen down here. So it's this, um, you know, mucosal layer herniating through the muscularis layer, and therefore there's no muscularis layer in the diverticulum and has no ability to void. Here's an example of how bladder volume measurement is done using one particular type of ultrasound machine. We start out here in the transverse plane with the indicator towards the patient's right. Uh, so this is like a cross-sectional view of the bladder. Therefore, this is anterior, this is posterior. We're measuring now the height of the bladder. And on this particular machine, we can lock in these values, D1, D2, D3. And then we measure the width of the bladder. This is the right lateral wall of the bladder. Here's the left lateral wall. We lock that value in, or we can write it down or save it in our calculator or whatever. And then we unfreeze the machine, and we rotate the transducer from a transverse plane to its sagittal plane. And in the sagittal plane, what was once right and left now become head, foot, or superior, inferior. And now we're going to measure the third dimension, or length, of the bladder. And as you do so with this particular machine, it starts to calculate at the volume for you as you measure this third volume. I mean, third uh, diameter, but you can always write these volumes down in its um, height times width times length divided by two, and that will give you that um, estimation of the bladder volume. 
Now, color Doppler can be used to evaluate for ureteric peristalsis by showing periodic jetting of urine flow into the urinary bladder lumen from the ureteric orifice. The number of jets are counted on each side to determine the jet frequency. So the total jet frequency is the total number of jets counted from each ureterovesicular junction over a four minute period. The relative jet frequency is the number of bladder jets on the symptomatic side divided by the total jet frequency. So if the relative jet frequency is less than 40%, it's considered an abnormal test and one might consider ordering a CT scan to try to find a stone in the ureter causing an obstruction. See, the problem with ultrasound is that it doesn't see the ureters very well. We can see the uretopelvic junction, and we can see the urovesicular junction, but in between we don't see that on ultrasound because of all the loops of bowel. But if we have a relative jet frequency less than 40%, that may, may want us, make us want to do a CT scan. So this is what um, a bladder jet looks like coming from first the left orifice and then the right orifice. The orange color indicates a bladder jet. This is using power flow Doppler and note the low pulse repetition frequency in the 600s over here. This low pulse repetition frequency maximizes our sensitivity of the Doppler to pick up the urine jet. The lower the pulse repetition frequency, the less the ultrasound machine is sending pulses or the less it's talking and the more it's listening. And we all know that the more we listen, the more sensitive we are. And so by lowering the PRF, we have um, better sensitivity. Now, you could also use um, grayscale, overgain it a little bit, and um, you could see the jet firing along in the posterior bladder wall. Periodically, the ureter contracts, and this is possible to view this on the grayscale flow of the urine posteriorly through the bladder wall. And so if, you're, um, if you want to do this on yourself, up on the third floor lounge, you could do that. You could drink, you know, a couple glasses of water, and it's even better if you use caffeine, which I think is what we were doing here. And um, and you could see that that's a pretty strong jet. Overgain the image a little bit, and you could see these jets coming out. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> and this is a 66 year old guy who had a Foley catheter placed several days ago, and then was sent home. He returned complaining of urinary retention, and his Foley catheter is no longer putting out urine. Bladder ultrasound shows the catheter in the correct location. The balloon is inflated. Um, as an image window acquisitional sort of technical note, the depth is too deep, and this depth should be decreased so as to not waste all this free screen real estate down here. In other words, the scan window depth is here at 22 centimeters, way too deep. It really only needs to be 8 or 10 centimeters. And if you did that, the bladder would take up the majority of the screen as it's doing here. Now the depth is adjusted properly and the patient continues to complain of urinary retention. In fact, the Foley catheter is not putting out any urine. After multiple attempts to irrigate and finally to deflate that Foley balloon were unsuccessful, a 22 gauge needle was directed down towards the Foley balloon. We did this percutaneously right through the skin under ultrasound guidance to rupture the Foley balloon and enable successful removal of that Foley catheter. And so anytime we need to take a sharp object and put it into somebody's soft tissue, we can do so under ultrasound guidance. And during Clinical, Clinical Foundations 3, right before you head off to the third year medical school, we have a, a really cool lab where we go through and we do a bunch of ultrasound guided procedures and get you ready for that. So in, in summary, urosonography remains the initial imaging modality of choice to assess bladder function by demonstrating adequate storage volumes and complete bladder emptying. Measuring post-void residual volume easily identifies voiding dysfunction. The bladder wall can undergo inspection and any intra and extra luminal abnormalities can be detected using ultrasound. And finally, guidance of suprapubic bladder catheterization can be done under ultrasound visualization to improve patient safety. When we look at a kidney, we're really looking, we're kind of breaking it up into whether we see something out in the cortex or we see something that's where the collecting system is, or the, what I, what's also called the renal pelvis, or the renal sinus. We also refer to that sort of as the collecting system. So if something is out in the cortex and it's anechoic and it's spherical in all dimensions, well, then it's a renal cyst. But if you see anechoic stuff in the center or the pelvis of the kidney, that's hydronephrosis. That's fluid building up in the kidney. And this is what hydronephrosis looks like.
It's just a little bit of a glove-like formation when we get back to the kidney. See how it kind of splays out a little bit? In the center, there's the pelvis, and the fingers of the glove kind of go out towards its cortex. That's a little bit of mild hydronephrosis there. It's just barely even noticeable. But you move on, you see a little bit more. See, we, we can see the fingers of the glove kind of going out into these different projections. They eventually all coalesce, but not until we get to right at the renal sinus does it coalesce down here. So that's another bit of, I would say, mild amount of hydronephrosis. It's a very nebulous grading category. Um, but here it's sort of splaying out a little bit, sort of mild. We can still make out plenty of cortex. This is all cortex out here. There's plenty of cortex left in that kidney. When we have a, a stone, or in this case we have a couple of stones here in this kidney, we know that they're stones because they exude a shadow all the way to the bottom of the screen. You see that? So sometimes you'll see stuff that's hyperechoic but doesn't shadow. But when, when you get a shadow that goes all the way to the bottom of the screen that way, you can confirm that that's from a very dense calcified structure. The sound's getting reflected off that shadow. And in this case, it's from renal lithiasis or kidney stones. This is an example here of a renal cyst. Notice that it's out in the cortex of the kidney. This is the liver. This is the kidney. We're losing the lower pole from all this bowel gas. But as we get out, we can actually see a cyst up here, and then there's another little cyst down here. Here's that cyst towards the upper pole over here. And no matter how you rotate the probe, from transverse to coronally, the cyst is always spherical and anechoic in all planes. This is what happens when we get a really a lot of hydronephrosis backing up in the kidney. Our cortex is starting to go away, and all those finger-like projections are now coalescing to one large hypo or anechoic area here seen in the pelvis of the kidney. And that's more like moderate hydronephrosis. When all those fingers kind of come together, we can still make out the cortex, though. See out here we can still see cortex? If all I saw was a big black center where the kidney should be, and there's no cortex left, it's very, very rare, but that would be severe hydronephrosis. The fact that I can still make out cortex to me tells me this is probably moderate. You heard of polycystic kidney disease? This is what it looks like on ultrasound. These are all these cysts seen out here in the cortex. We can make that one here, this one here, this one here, this one down here. Polycystic kidneys, and it's bilateral. And you can see it also affect other organs. Sometimes you can see cysts in the spleen, you see them around the liver, ovaries look like this when they're polycystic disease. You talk about ultrasound of the bowel, well first right off the bat I know that you know who the enemy of ultrasound is, right? Who's the enemy of ultrasound? Air. Bowel gas, generally speaking. Um, and so that's the problem. We have the enemy of ultrasound being the bowel gas and in some patients it's, uh, it's pretty significant how much bowel gas they can have, right? So that's why we have to somehow overcome that enemy. Now, in a guy like this, I don't know if there's anything I could do to actually examine his bowel using ultrasound because he's just so at the end of that spectrum of, of bowel distension. But, um, but in other patients, though, we can, we can get through and see their intestines actually quite easily, even when they have a lot of pathology, which I'll show you here in a second. So we're going to be talking about bowel obstructions, where the gas is located, and appendicitis in this quick little um, demonstration. So generally speaking, to insinate the intestines, what you want to use is you want to use the linear probe, okay? Now, I know that what you're thinking, the linear probes for structures that are superficial, and that's high frequency. However, when you start to use this, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to use a compression technique to look at the intestines. You're going to push down on the abdomen using that linear probe. And that basically what that does is as you compress the abdominal wall, you are decreasing the effective focal point of that transducer, meaning that you can actually get away with using linear probe with the intestine because you're pushing down so hard that structures that used to be far away are now much closer to your probe. For example, you're trying to find the psoas muscle, which is down by the spine, a deep structure. However, when you compress the skin four, five, six centimeters down into the body, well, now you can take advantage of the fact that you're so close to those structures that you can use this linear probe, which is why for the most part, this is my transducer of choice. Now, if I did have a very large patient like that guy we just saw, certainly I'd be leaning towards using one of my lower frequency curvilinear probes, hopefully one with a large footprint like the C60. But that being said, the linear transducer can usually get through a lot of this intestinal ultrasound. And what we're going to do is we're going to do something called mowing the lawn. 
And what that means is we are going to start in the right upper quadrant and find the ascending colon. That's where it always is, right up there in the right upper quadrant. We can tell it's ascending colon because it's got haustra. Recall that haustra are little indentations in the bow wall that don't cross all the way across the, the midline to the other wall. They're just like little sections that are sectioned off. Whereas in the small bow, we have something called plique circularis that do cross the entire wall of the bow. So I'll show you in a minute. That's kind of how we quickly can decide between small bow and large bow on any imaging study, looking at haustra versus plique circularis. That sounds like it's minutia, but actually it's that comes into play quite a bit in most fields. So something you might want to remember. You're going to follow that ascending colon. First I go down to the right lower quadrant, looking around where the appendix would be, okay? And the cecum's got a blind-ended loop down there, and that's the location where you'll find the terminal ilium, and the appendix will pop right off the terminal ilium. And do I always see those structures? No, but I know that that's where they're supposed to be. And really what I'm doing, especially when it comes to appendicitis, is I'm looking for a non-compressible tubular structure down there. I'll get into that in a minute. But once you get down there, then you can follow the the continue mowing the lawn by going back up, back up the ascending colon, across the transverse, and then down the descending portions of the colon. And you're basically following that all the way down to the sigmoid, down into the pelvis. That's where you can take a peek at the uh, urinary bladder. And, um, and that's sort of the overall process. You do that in a transverse plane like we've outlined here with this magic marker. And then you would do the same thing in a sagittal plane going side to side rather than up and down. And that's kind of how I think of it. When I'm doing a focused appendicitis exam, which is I do quite often in the ER, I keep this mowing the lawn technique just around the right lower quadrant where the appendix is located, down there what we call McBurney's point. Or sometimes just hand the transducer to the patient and I say, put this where the pain is. And, um, and then they start to push it on their abdominal wall and they kind of lo help, help to localize where I should start my search for their etiology of their pain. Normal intestine kind of looks like this. Um, it's got a layered appearance, it's easily compressible, and it should intermittently peristalse. And the large intestine's wall is less than four millimeters, and small intestine, everybody argues about it, but it's less than four millimeters also, probably closer to being less than three millimeters, but it's definitely thinner than the large intestine is. And um, just keep in mind that on ultrasound, the colon has that typical haustra, and um, that right hemicolon is usually filled with stool and gas, whereas the left hemicolon is usually found in a somewhat contracted condition. Now, as you can see here, this is abnormal intestine. How do I know that? Well, I measured the wall thickness. We measure from the outside edge of the wall all the way down to where the lumen starts here. And this is where the lumen is here. This is like stool and feces and a little bit of air. These little punctate things here, that's probably air. Whenever I see dots on the screen, those are almost always air. And so the wall actually extends right to where the lumen starts, okay? So over here, the wall would start here all the way down to where the lumen starts. In fact, down here, the lumen starts right about here, okay? So this is abnormal when we see it thickened like this. We, lot, we had the loss of that layered appearance. It's kind of hanging out by itself. It's no longer compressible. That's another thing. Normal intestine should be nicely compressible. And if you look around the edges of this, stuff that's inflamed always appears hyperechoic, very bright. And we can see around the edges of the structure here, it's got these hyperechoic areas. And when I compress them, um, there exudes this mass effect. It all kind of moves together as one unit. Now, intestines should easily flop around each other and slip around each other and should slide amongst one another when there's um, inflammation or ab abnormality there, then um, it all moves together like a unit. And this is an example here of a patient who had pseudomembranous colitis. So how do we overcome the enemy of, ultras of, of bowel gas? Well, the first thing I do is um, I have the patient cross their right leg over their left leg. And we'll do this today with the models. Um, on my earlier demonstration, um, I forgot to do that, but I think it's important to do that, to put the right leg over the left leg as far as possible without the patient falling off the table. And then um, you're going to push really hard. You're going to push harder in the abdomen than you've ever pushed before with an ultrasound transducer today. But don't worry, the models are getting paid to tolerate that. Um, they'll push you away if it hurts too much. Um, we also are going to give the models fentanyl. We're going to give them narcotics today. Just kidding. No, but in, in, re in reality, this is what you do, okay? People say, 
Ultrasound is a very operator dependent thing. Some people are good at finding the appendix, some people aren't. No. Appendicitis is a very fentanyl dependent thing. You guys know what fentanyl is a narcotic, short acting, lasts 20 minutes. We use it a lot in patients who have acute pain in the emergency department. I can give someone a good slug of fentanyl and it really does take the edge off their, their pain so that I can compress and get into their abdomen using ultrasound. It's a much more humane way to do than what we're going to do today to our models. Um, but the good news is uh, when you have disease states of the intestine, there's less peristalsis, there's bowel wall thickening, there's less intraluminal gas, which makes abnormal intestine easy to see easier to see than, norm, than, than normal intestine. So abnormal intestine like that pseudomembranous colitis picture you just saw, we, we could really deep see the outline pretty well of those uh, loops of bowel. When we have gas inside the wall of the bowel, this is a very abnormal condition. This tells us that um, an infection is produced so far that we're getting gas inside the wall of the bowel. We can see these granular appearance intra intramural, mural means wall, as opposed to intraluminal, which means to see gas inside the lumen or center of the bowel is normal, but to see in the wall, that's always abnormal. This is an example of a combined picture of intramural over here, intramural gas, always abnormal, versus intraluminal, which we expect to see, okay? Here's some more intramural gas. Okay, over here, this is a patient who's got a very severe condition called necrotizing enterocolitis. We see air in the wall, intramural air. This is another patient that we had in the emergency department. This is all ascites right here. So ascites builds up when the liver starts to fail. Fluid builds up, and we can actually see the intestine very well when ascites outlines the loops of bowel. And here we see intramural gas building up inside this person's um, bowel wall. Okay, switching gears now, we're going to talk a little bit about something called small bowel obstruction. Very, very common emergency we see in the emergency department all over the hospital, small bowel obstructions. And basically, plain films can get you in trouble here because they can be inaccurate. Up to about 30% of the time, plain films are not going to help you in somebody who's got a full-blown small bowel obstruction. It's for various reasons, but just uh, keep in mind that Ultrasound may be the way to go here with small bowel obstruction while you're waiting to get the definitive test, which is a CT scan. So somewhere between x-ray and CT lies ultrasound with its test characteristics. Um, and what you see with ultrasound is pretty easy to see, actually. If I've got a patient who's pretty distended, I just walk over with the ultrasound probe. They're vomiting. They've got all the clinical signs of small bowel obstruction. Well, this is what I see. I see these dilated loops here of small bowel. Notice the plique circularis going all the way across the bowel there. The walls are usually thickened, though sometimes in the early small bowel obstruction, the walls have yet to become thickened. And this is where it can excel over chest uh, abdominal x-rays is the fact that you could have a very proximal small bowel obstruction where um, the x-rays doesn't see it because the patient's been vomiting so much there's no longer an air fluid level and therefore the x-ray could miss it. Well, ultrasound can pick those up. And also there's something called a closed loop obstruction. You know what that is? A closed loop obstruction is where you have small bowel that's been um, twisted on both ends and there's a, a section in between a closed loop where there's no air. It's just a small bowel obstruction without air in it. And without the air, you don't get the air fluid levels you see on, a, on an x-ray. And so that's how x-rays miss these, which we see very quite easily on, on an ultrasound. And so this is just another example here of the small bowel, the plique circularis going all the way across and with, it definitely has thickened wall. And if we look adjacent to it, there's even free fluid between two of these loops of bowel. When you see free fluid like that between two loops of bowel in a patient with a small bowel obstruction, that's a surgical emergency. The presence of free fluid means we need to go to the operating room now on this patient. Because you can have an early, grade, early small bowel obstruction or maybe a narcotic ileus where the bowel is just kind of slowing down, starting to get a little bit dilated. But when there's actually free fluid, that suggests microperforation and that this patient needs to go to the operating room. Okay, switching gears, finally, the appendix. And the acute appendicitis, very, very common, okay? It's the most common surgical abdominal emergency in North America. About a third of patients, though, don't have that classic presentation, which is generalized abdominal pain that then um, locates itself to the right lower quadrant, what we call McBurney's point. Um, and 
associated with anorexia and um, elevated white blood cell count. Uh, that's a classic presentation I just described to you. I have patients coming in eating Cheetos who later go to the operating room for acute appendicitis and the pathology specimen comes out positive for appendicitis. So I've seen a lot of atypical presentations of appendicitis and that's where we have to turn to imaging. Now CT clearly has the best characteristics here, but doing a CT scan is about 500 chest x-rays worth of radiation. And when you're young in life, um, you have uh, more, your, your tissue is more radiosensitive and you have a longer time in which to absorb radiation throughout your life and radiation exposure at, to put you at risk for cancer is a cumulative effect so we try to avoid um, unnecessary CT use especially in patients less than 35 years old and certainly when I have a kid in my ER 10, 12, 14 years old I really try to avoid getting CAT scan on them though sometimes I have to get it because the risk uh, or the benefit outweighs the risk now, if we could get good with ultrasound, though, and see a true appendicitis on ultrasound, we could avoid the need for a CT scan, and especially in a younger patient. The average age of somebody who gets appendicitis is 27 years old. So Terasawa, the author, did a meta-analysis uh, a long time ago, six years ago, back when the ultrasound machines weren't as good, and found out that in, in the hands of radiology, uh, ultrasound had a sensitivity of 86% and a specificity of 81%. The reason for its low specificity is because we never see this on ultrasound. Feast your eyes on it, it's a normal appendix. I can only see it about 15 to 20% of the time. Um, although I think I might have seen one earlier today on Tyler when I was pre-scanning him. Um, so that's the problem, it's hard to see a normal. But to see the abnormal appendix, I'm gonna show what those look like in a second, that's actually pretty good, which is why the sensitivity is a little bit better. This is an 18-year-old woman who had lower abdominal pain. We can see here this blind, tubular blind-ended um, structure here, nice thin walls, certainly less than five millimeters um, down there, right adjacent to her external iliac uh, artery seen right here. Now, when you look for appendicitis, what you're trying to do is you're trying to compress the abdominal wall musculature down to the psoas muscle. And if you wait for it and wait for it and keep compressing, keep compressing, eventually you'll see that little appendix um, pop its head out at you and, um, and then as soon as it's there, it's gone again. So hopefully you were recording it. But it gets sandwiched between the abdominal wall musculature and the psoas muscle. It should be no bigger than six millimeters when it's normal. And occasionally you can see an appendicolith, which translated means um, poop stone. So this is kind of what we do. Here's the abdominal wall musculature up here. Here's the loop of bowel right there, okay? This is the iliac vessel right there. And what we're doing is we're pushing really hard. So this muscle right here, this is the psoas muscle. The psoas muscle is actually coming up and coming into contact with the abdominal wall musculature right there. And there's loops of bowel that gets sandwiched between the psoas, which is a very long muscle. The psoas sandwiches the bowel. Now, if the bowel is normal, it just compresses, squirts out of the way like it is here. But if the bowel is abnormal, if it's acute appendicitis, then what happens is you get this round structure here that's more than six millimeters that lacks peristalsis that when you compress psoas all the way up to abdominal wall musculature, here's some abdominal wall musculature, probably abdominal oblique, here's rectus, this is psoas, it squishes that appendix there, and the appendix is a non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant that measures more than six millimeters. That's how you do it. That's the technique. This is, uh, here we're trying to identify the appendix. Here's our psoas muscle practically coming all the way to the abdominal skin. Uh, this patient's very, very thin. That's how we're able to do this. And yes, this is a lot easier in thin patients. And yes, this is a truly fentanyl dependent thing because look how much we're compressing this tissue. Now, if you have appendicitis, all these areas down here in the peritoneal cavity get inflamed. So, and it's, it's very painful to be compressing these things. This is the peritoneal lining right here. Okay, I can see that peritoneal lining very easily on ultrasound. Everything down here is all intestines and there's psoas muscle coming all the way up and coming in contact with abdominal wall musculature. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're sitting in the audience going, I don't see what the heck he's talking about. I just see some stuff move around the screen. But when the probe is in your hands, there's some kind of weird feedbacky loop thing going on that makes this easier to see. So in this case, it was normal. We didn't see the appendix, and um, the patient actually ended up getting a CT scan, which was negative for appendicitis. And we called the patient back, and they were fine. This is the abdominal wall musculature here, and this blind-ended tubular structure right here that's non-compressible in the right lower quadrant measuring eight millimeters is true acute appendicitis. And there's some psoas down here. 
we're pushing, we're squishing. Here's some part of the psoas here. There's another part down here. We're squishing the appendix up between psoas and abdominal wall musculature. Just another example of another patient with acute appendicitis. It starts to take on this characteristic blind-ended tubular structure. And I look at this both in transverse and I rotate the probe in a sagittal plane. But I gotta tell you, when I do find it, I feel like I'm so lucky. It's such a magical moment that I'm really careful to move the probe and I tell the patient not to move, and I'm like, really? That's when I'm really like paranoid I'm going to lose it on the screen because it's pretty exciting to see a true a positive appendicitis. That when I go from transverse to sagittal or from short to long axis on it, I'm really ginger how I move the probe. Here is uh, one last example of another patient with appendicitis. We can see here, this is the abdominal wall musculature. Again, this, this theme keeps coming up over and over again. Here's the psoas somewhere down here smooshing this appendix between the two muscle structures. I think psoas is actually over here too, I see over here. And um, this one's got a little fecalith right there, you see that? Which literally means poop stone right there. That's inside the appendix, and that's what happens, right? The little fecalith comes down and obstructs the opening of the appendix, and then the appendix just starts to get larger and larger and larger, can't drain its contents. And then finally the pressure inside the appendix gets higher than the ability for the blood vessels to to provide it with vasculature, and then you get ischemia, you get lack of blood flow to that appendix, and eventually the walls get thin and the pressure inside the appendix outweighs the ability of the wall to maintain its integrity, and the wall perforates, and the contents of the appendix spill out into the abdominal peritoneal cavity. And once that perforation occurs, surgery is often not of benefit, and you just give the patient antibiotics uh, for a couple of weeks, admit them to the hospital. Yes. There are risks that you can do to patients um, with ultrasound, such as dislodging a DVT. That does frighten me, but compressing an appendix, um, I, I don't think there's enough extrinsic pressure that you could perforate it. I think really the true perforation comes from the, the inside getting ready to, to make it pop. Because yeah, we're pushing a lot of pressure and maybe I oversold that too much. We're not pushing so hard that we're causing a very local part of it to, to perforate. I mean, we're pushing enough just to kind of get the, the the muscle bellies to come together. So to summarize with the intestines, you want to have a nice layered appearance, um, it should be easily compressible, you should see intermittent peristalsis, and keep in mind that large intestine has a wall thickness less than four millimeters, and small intestine is somewhat thinner than that.